Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the second annual Can Prevent Lung Cancer Conference. I'm Anil Vachani. I'm in the pulmonary division. This is my colleague, Robert Schnall, who's in the D Department of Psychiatry. Uh, and we'll both be sort of chairing the session here today, but we're, we have a couple of colleagues with us, and we're going to go through, a, we hope, a number of exciting or at least interesting talks for you today and review issues related to prevention of lung cancer. Um, just a show of hands in the audience. Anyone here last year? Okay, good, because a lot of our material is actually repeated from last year, so it would be perhaps a little too repetitive. Um, anyone with family members with lung cancer? Great. Anyone with a personal history of lung cancer? Okay. So we will certainly be talking about general risk factors. Um, Robbie and, and Frank, who's sitting over there, are, are, are experts in smoking cessation, so you're going to hear a lot about that this morning. We'll talk a little bit about lung cancer screening, because that's perhaps one of the most exciting areas that's come forward in the last year or two. Uh, and then well, we'll take questions. Um, so I would prefer, and I guess each speaker can speak for themselves, but at least during my presentation, which will go first, stop me as we, as we go. I will certainly leave some time at the end for questions, but if you have a question, just holler out if I don't see you, stop me, and, and then we'll get started. Great. Questions? Yeah. No. Just welcome, and uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions uh, while we're talking. Question number one. It's not too uh, um, easy for it to, to not come back or to to start with cancer, is that true? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question, and I think that we're gonna address that actually in several of the talks as we go through today. So I'm gonna actually have you hold on that before we give you a specific answer, and we're gonna address that in my talk a little bit, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what the risk is as people quit smoking, and then we'll talk about lung function issues as we go forward as well. So hold on to that thought, and we'll come back to it. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, it's good to know. So uh, a couple of brief announcements as we start. The uh, Abramson Cancer Center gratefully acknowledges donors, corporations, and foundations supporting this conference. And that includes Toll Brothers Incorporated, Mr. Brian Efron, Philip, and the late Bunny Kendall. Um, and then in your agendas today are some biographical information on all of today's speakers. And you can learn more about us uh, uh, also by visiting penmedicine.org. You're going to hear a presentation later this morning on something called Oncolink.org, which is a patient information-based website and provides cancer inf specific information on various cancers, uh, both prevention, treatment, and survivorship issues. So you can go there. Additional information is available at penmedicine.org backslash Abramson uh, to learn more about cancer issues. Today's program is being video recorded and will be available to view after the conference at penmedicine.org backslash Abramson backslash can prevent lung. We can certainly give you that information if you want to view this uh, after today's, uh, today's presentations. Um, it's also on the bottom of, uh, of the pages I think you guys should have received in your information packet. So if you had friends or family members who would be interested in learning more about lung cancer and they weren't able to be here today, they can certainly be guided towards that website to see some of today's presentations and have access to other information. Okay, any questions before we get started then? Okay, so again, this is a relatively small group. I wanna keep it as informal as possible. I know I'm up at the podium, but stop me as we go, okay? So we're gonna start off this morning by a topic um, that's listed on your agenda as Lung Cancer Risk 101. This is really just a, a brief introduction to lung cancer and lung cancer risk factors just to sort of set the stage for some of the presentations that are going to come after me. So when we talk about lung cancer risk, I think it's important to know what lung cancer numbers are doing in the United States and how they're doing relative to other cancers. So this is a graph from the American Cancer Society which provides data on what our lung cancer rates are doing. So this is a graph that shows um, I'm not sure this is showing up very well on this white slide, but we have year on the bottom axis here starting at 1975 going up to the latest data that we have right now is 2007, 2008. 
And on this axis, we have the number of lung cancer cases that occur per 100,000 patients in the population, so it's a per capita rate. But the important point to note, the lung cancer line is the blue line, that's sort of second down right there. And the good news is that, at least amongst men, we really peaked in lung cancer rates really back here in the 1980s, where there were approximately um, 100 cases of lung cancer per 100,000 people in the population. And since that time, we've actually had an, a slow but steady decline. Now, we certainly haven't gotten all the way down to zero cases, unfortunately, but we're down now to somewhere in the ballpark of about 65 cases per 100,000 population. So we've made some strides in men. If we look at the, the, and let me go back and just point out that compared to others, it is the second most common cause of cancer in men behind prostate cancer, which is the most common, and is uh, a little bit more common than colon and, and rectal cancer. And the other cancers are at significantly lower rates. In women, we see a similar pattern in that it's the second most common cancer behind breast cancer. Lung cancer for right now occurs in approximately 50 women per 100,000 in the population. This is according to 2007. And the news here is that we are not going down yet. We're still leveling off. Uh, but we anticipate that this curve will also start to go down as we go forward. And the reason for that is our smoking rates in the United States have been declining over the last couple decades, and we're going to hear more about that. They're certainly not where we'd like them to be, but we have made major strides since the 1950s and 60s in our smoking rates, and that's primarily what accounts for lower lung cancer rates that we're seeing now. So just to orient you to the lung anatomy very briefly, and I have sort of three different cartoons up here of the lungs to, to see how this works. The lungs are, um, of course, organs in the chest. They are surrounded by two, a tissue layer called the pleura. It really just bathes the lung in a small amount of fluid and protects the lung. Um, this is the trachea that comes down and divides up to connect to your right lung or to your left lung. When seen in cross-section, you can see that um, the cavity is primarily lung with a very small tissue layer on top. That's the the pink layer you see on this graph here. And in this in cross section, so we're sort of slicing through the lung this way, you can see that the lung tissue itself is sort of beefy pink, beefy red, primarily composed of air though, um, as that is the major function of the lung is to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And tumors of the lung can develop really anywhere inside of this space, either closer to the center or out near the ribs. This is sort of the space where lung cancer occurs. On a chest x-ray or a CAT scan, which is what I'm showing here, this is a chest x-ray on the left, a CAT scan on the right, a lung tumor shows up as a shadow. So in this x-ray, this shadow here is the heart. These lines going across are the ribs. And when you get a chest x-ray because of symptoms, one of the things that we're looking for is whether there's any abnormal shadow that could look like a mass, and that is this shadow here. On a CAT scan, the picture is taken, again, in cross section, so we're taking a slice similar to this area here, and in that slice of a CT scan, you see uh, your heart, your two lungs are here, one on this side, one on this side, and this is the abnormal appearance of a lung cancer. It's a, it's a mass of, uh, at least in this case, a few centimeters that has little uh, bumpiness to it, certainly raises concern for a lung cancer. So let's run through the major risk factors. And I'll go through these fairly quickly, but stop me if there are questions. What I've tried to do here is list the major risk factors we consider in a particular patient for lung cancer. And the percentages here are how much that particular factor contributes to lung cancer in the population. So these numbers will not add up to 100 because in some patients, in many patients, more than one risk factor can be involved in contributing to their development of cancer. But we know that, in the United States at least, that tobacco use accounts for approximately 80, at least contributes to approximately 85 to 90 percent of all lung cancers. Occupational exposures, primarily asbestos exposure, but exposure to other things such as stars, metals, things like chromium and nickel also occur, primarily in, in certain occupational exposures. The good news here is that this is also declining in the United States, so we have made pretty good strides since the 1980s and 1990s to decrease our reliance on asbestos in the construction and shipbuilding industries. And so uh, while we still continue to see lung cancers due to asbestos exposure, particularly for those folks who worked prior to the 1980s, 
Uh, we are fairly confident that we will continue to see a decline in asbestos-related lung cancer cases as we continue to move forward, given the, the protections that are increasingly being put in place in the United States. This is not necessarily true across the world, as asbestos use remains fairly rampant in places like Asia and South America. Um, and so we are continuing to make efforts there to decrease asbestos use. A risk factor that folks often are unaware of is radon exposure. Radon is a gas that is present in really the soil or in, ro in, in a rock beneath our soil. It's relatively common in the Delaware Valley and across the United States. Uh, my recommendation to, to folks, and actually it's, it's uh, let me just add that it's estimated to, to lead or at least contribute to approximately 10% of lung cancer cases now in the United States. The only time that we are forced to have our homes or basements primarily tested for radon is when we're selling our homes or buying homes. Um, but I recommend individuals who have poorly ventilated basements to have their, their house tested for radon. This can be done fairly inexpensively, and if we do, know, we do believe that remediating radon when it's at a, at a level above what is considered to be safe is an appropriate public health measure and something that individuals should consider doing for themselves. We don't have good estimates on exactly what is a safe level of radon in your basement. Currently, uh, guidelines suggest that a level of four is what is used to determine whether you should have your basement remediated or not. But that's something that you should, uh, 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 certainly if there's questions, read up on further, and you're welcome to discuss with me after the program if that's of particular interest to you. There are, again, additional risk factors, uh, primarily in non lifelong non-smokers that we are particularly concerned about, things like outdoor air pollution and, and secondhand smoke. Um, this is primarily studies based on individuals who've lived with long-term smokers. So if you've lived with, grew up with your parents who smoked in the house for a long period of time, or lived with a spouse who smokes inside the home and, and have been exposed for many, many years, we think that contributes, each of these contributes approximately one to two percent of the lung cancers that occur in the United States. Questions on any of that stuff? Great. So let's just focus a little bit more on, on tobacco use. Um, and I'm going to throw up a couple terms that I'll try and explain. So cigarette smoking has what we call a relative risk of something called 10 to 20. So what does that mean? It means that if you're a lifelong non-smoker, we believe that the risk, lifelong risk of lung cancer for you is somewhere in the ballpark of one out of 100. Lifelong risk. So even if you've never smoked in your life, our risk of lung cancer is approximately one out of 100 during our lifetime. If you've smoked cigarettes regularly for many decades, and this is again variable because people have smoked for different years and different number of cigarettes per day, we think that risk goes up by 10 to 20 times. So that means your risk increases to a risk of somewhere between approximately one out of five to one out of 10 lifetime risk if you are a lifelong long-term smoker. And that's where the relative risk of 10 to 20 comes from. Uh, of course, your risk, as I just mentioned, really much varies based on the number of cigarettes per day that you've smoked and the total number of years that someone has smoked. And it does change with smoking cessation. So I think there was a question at the beginning about quitting smoking and how it affects um, things such as lung function, but also lung cancer risk. We know now, and I think I have it coming up, that, uh, that if you quit smoking, that your lung cancer risk decreases significantly. And I'm gonna show you a slide on that in just a moment. It's actually not the next one, but it will be coming up shortly. So this is one slide that talks about that issue on a population-based level. We have seen um, smoking rates go, and we're, again, we're looking at 1965 starting here, going up to data to 2009 in this graph. That smoking rates back in the 60s were in the ballpark of 50% of men used to smoke and approximately 35% of women smoked. We have made some strides, so there were now in the ballpark of about 20% of adults um, smoke in the United States. So glass half full or glass half empty is based on perspective. We've certainly made major strides, but people will tell you, and I agree, that we have a long way to go because we need to get this number down to zero. Um, and I guess this, we're going to skip through that slide real quickly, but just to point out that as smoking consumption has decreased, so has lung cancer. And this sort of really helps tie in the fact that smoking is the biggest driver of lung cancer risk in our country. Um, so the, the greater we can do in terms of decreasing smoking rates, the, the lower our lung cancer rates will go. This is the graph I was going to show, and I mentioned earlier about how smoking 
Um, quitting smoking affects lung cancer risk. So this is a graph that shows your lifetime risk on this axis. So if you are a lifetime smoker, you're, you're, and this is your age on this axis, so let's, this starts off at 45, but assuming that you've smoked your entire life regularly, your risk as you get older goes from being very low all the way up to about 15%. So again, that's a risk of about one in five to one in 10 based on sort of averages of developing lung cancer. If you quit, so this line here, this dotted balloon line is if you quit at age 60. This one is if you quit at age 50. This one is if you quit at age 40, 30, or if you were a never smoker. So as you can see, your lifetime risk drops very significantly the earlier you quit in your life. So there's never, it's never too late to quit is the message. Uh, you will always benefit, at least in terms of decreasing your risk for developing lung cancer, if you quit. Even if you've been a, lo a, a long-term smoker, quitting is important. Yes? So if you quit at 40, oh, excuse me. Let me see if I can use this pointer correctly. So if you quit at 40, which is this line right here, the average lifetime risk looks like it's right about 3%. Now, then that's a population-based risk, but overall, if you took all smokers who smoked starting in their teens, quit at 40, their risk on average would be about 3% over their lifetime. Asbestos, let's just jump back to asbestos. I mentioned briefly that we've come a long way. This is just to give you some perspective on what an asbestos mine used to look like back in the 1980s. This is up in Newfoundland. You can see that these are very impressive areas where the soil just gets stripped to be able to identify asbestos in an asbestos mine. And certainly the workers, the, the folks who are exposed the most are the folks who have worked in asbestos mines in the past, particularly when they were not using any respiratory mask protection. Uh, fortunately, all asbestos mines, in the, at least in, the, in North America, are now closed. Uh, but this is a, a picture that I think speaks a thousand words, so I thought I'd show you what it, what it looks like. Asbestos is a fiber that's, again, um, mined from the soil. There's a few different types that I'm not going to really spend a lot of type, time on. But the, what, what happens with these very, very small fibers, and this is, again, under a microscope, these things are only a few microns long, is that they can get inhaled into the lung. They get inhaled into the lung, and then they can then move through the lung to various places and lodge into either the lung tissue or the lining of our lung, which is called the, the pleura, which causes mesothelioma. But if the, if the fibers get lodged in the lung, they contribute to developing lung cancer as well. And I, and I guess to also add to that point that it also contributes to a couple of what are called benign diseases or non-cancer diseases such as asbestosis, which is a disease of the lung where there's fibrosis in the lung and can lead to breathing difficulties. And again, lung cancer and mesothelium being the two most common cancers caused by asbestos. We talked a little bit about radon earlier, but just to touch base on this in a little greater detail. Um, it is at least now in the United States thought to be the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. Uh, given that the risk of asbestos, occupational asbestos exposure has declined significantly over the last couple of decades. Um, and our primary exposure is again the residential radon through poorly ventilated basements. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, we, we think that a level of, the studies that have been done have really looked at a level of five in, in our basements as being uh, what we think is where risk really starts to, to increase, which is why we use four as a cutoff for where it should be remediated. So if, that, if your basement has a level higher than four, it should uh, have a remediation system placed uh, to allow greater ventilation. And that just essentially causes your radon levels to go below one. We talked a little bit about environmental tobacco smoke. Let's just go over that data in a little greater detail. Most of these studies that have been done have been done in people with spouses or, uh, or a few in workplace studies that have looked at long-term, several years of exposure to regular smokers at work or, or in the home. And then there's an overall about a 20 to 30% increased risk for exposure to secondhand smoke. So while this is not a nearly as much of a risk of primary cigarette exposure, again, which is 20 times, so that's 200% if you were to think about it in percentages, we still think that this is a significant problem, and we um, certainly uh, talk to our patients about 
talking to their family members or, or workplace members to be smoking in areas where they are not exposing you uh, or to your friends to, to secondhand smoke. Family history. I'm not sure I've mentioned this one earlier. But family history, the idea that whether a first degree relative of yours has ever had lung cancer is also a risk factor for you. This is clearly the idea of genetics. So if you have parents or a sibling who's had lung cancer, you share a certain number of genes with either your parents or with your siblings, and that places you at slightly increased risk for having lung cancer. We think that risk approximately is 80% higher if you have um, a single family member or single first degree relative with lung cancer. If you have multiple family members who've had lung cancer, uh, particularly if those family members were diagnosed at a relatively early age, um, that places you at, even increased, at an increased risk of developing lung cancer. It is particularly important then for individuals who have family members who've had lung cancer to not smoke, because that is the best way to make sure you minimize your risk for developing lung cancer throughout your lifetime. I'll mention arsenic very briefly. This is a, um, arsenic is a contaminant, again, in our soil, found primarily in our drinking water in various places across the country. Again, thought, also thought to contribute to lung cancer risk. Probably not a major risk, but probably contributes to, again, somewhere in the ballpark of 1% or 2% of lung cancers in the United States. This is just a, uh, a graph to show you that um, arsenic uh, varies significantly across the United States. Um, the, showing here, low levels go from this little white box up to very high levels being um, sort of brightly pink. And, Based on studies across the United States, this map has been put together to show where levels are highest. Now, we're at relatively moderate levels in our area, but certainly if you go into western Pennsylvania, Ohio, some areas of the Midwest, Nevada, some parts of California, you can see relatively high levels of arsenic. Um, there are ways to have your own drinking water evaluated for arsenic levels if that was of interest, and we can discuss this with anyone if they, so, if they want to. Uh, uh, something just to be aware of as we go forward, because as we handle the tobacco issue, again, which is a long, still a long way to go, we are increasingly focusing on other risk factors that contribute to, to lung cancer cases in, in the United States. There are other risk factors that we haven't talked much about and I won't talk in great deal about, but we talked a little bit about genetics. We certainly understand that genetics and the genes that we are born with all contribute to how we develop diseases, including cancers, and all of us have certain genes that may or may not place us, at, place us at greater risk for developing cancers. There are no genetic tests out there that we recommend for individuals yet, but these things are perhaps coming down the pike where someday you might be able to get a blood test and have a sense for what genes you have and how those contribute to your lung cancer risk and to other, other disease risks. But for right now, there are no specific tests out there for, for individuals to, to, um, to pursue. There are other things such as uh, being exposed to diesel exhaust, car exhaust, presence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or emphysema, uh, fibrotic diseases of the lung, uh, and maybe even dietary factors that may contribute to lung cancer risk. Again, we think these are, are somewhat minor risks, and I won't go to them in great detail, but if this affects you and you're interested, I'll be happy to talk about, about this with you um, during the question and answer period or after the conference. And that's all I got. So that is the whirlwind tour of lung cancer risk factors. We're going to then move on to, I think Dr. Schnall is going to be next. And the title of his presentation is, I know I should quit, why can't I? I'm sorry, so COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's another term for people with chronic bronchitis or emphysema. It's a disease that usually leads to individuals who are, who've been smokers who, uh, that leads to symptoms such as shortness of breath, sort of regular coughing. Um, if you feel that you know someone or if you yourself have symptoms like that, you could be evaluated to see if you have symptoms of COPD. Um, while we know that we have certain medications that can treat people who have those symptoms, uh, we also know that it's a separate risk factor for lung cancer, and we, we address that um, by keeping a close eye on patients and considering whether we should do lung cancer screening as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later this morning. Thanks. Right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank, thanks very much for coming. Um, so I, I just want to say but before I get started that uh, we do have the question and answer period 
at the end of today, but unfortunately I have another meeting that I have to attend, so I won't be able to stay for that. But if you don't get a chance to ask your question during my talk now, I'll leave some of my business cards on the table in the back, and you feel free to take one and email me or call me uh, later on uh, next week, all right? So I'm going to talk with you about quitting smoking. Um, just to give you uh, a little bit of background, why it's important to quit smoking, uh, sort of a little bit more detail just beyond uh, quitting smoking to avoid getting lung cancer, and that is because there are more than 4,000 known chemicals uh, in each cigarette. Some of these include cyanide and arsenic and formaldehyde. Many of these are known uh, carcinogens, and they're found in insecticides, nail polish remover, and toilet cleaners. About 85% of lung cancer cases are attributable to smoking cigarettes, as, in, as Anil said, and it causes a number of other res respiratory uh, diseases as well. Uh, smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. Uh, more than 400,000 Americans pass away prematurely because of smoking, and in addition to that, uh, exposure to secondhand smoke is responsible for another 49,000 deaths in the U.S. In addition, it's expensive to smoke. About uh, each uh, smoker in Pennsylvania uh, spends about $2,500 each year on cigarettes, and that uh, number is consistently going up. And across the U.S., uh, smoking is responsible for uh, almost $200 billion in annual costs, including $97 billion in lost productivity and another $96 billion in health care expenditures. And annually, an additional $10 billion uh, is uh, spent on treating diseases due to uh, secondhand smoke exposure. So it's deadly and it's expensive. And what are the benefits of quitting smoking? This is uh, reflective of, of one of the questions that was answered, answered earlier. This gives you a bit of a breakdown uh, of some of the specific uh, benefits that can be gained by quitting smoking. So on average, non-smokers live 10 years longer than smokers do overall. Uh, and the benefits of quitting smoking are greater for people who stop at earlier stages. You saw in the slide that Anil had that the risk of getting cancer by the age of 75 was lower the earlier it is that you quit smoking. But there are some immediate benefits of quitting smoking. So within two weeks to three months after quitting, your heart attack risk drops and your lung function starts to improve. After about a year, your risk of heart disease is lowered by about 50%. In five years, your stroke risk is, re is reduced to that of a lifetime non-smoker. After 10 years, risk of many cancers decreases substantially. And after 15 years of having quit smoking, your risk of heart disease is equal to that of a non-smoker, and risk of lung cancer is about half that of a continuing smoker. So there are immediate benefits of quitting smoking and important long-term benefits for your health. So unfortunately, quitting smoking is a very difficult uh, thing to do. Uh, most smokers, when you ask them, want to quit smoking. Uh, you very, very rarely do you uh, encounter a smoker that's very proud of smoking and very reluctant to try and quit. Uh, about seven in 10 people who are smokers said that they want to quit smoking. And millions and millions and millions of people have been able to successfully quit smoking. It's difficult, as Mark Twain said, you know, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Um, and it's difficult because uh, smoking is a learned habit. It's something that we have often been engaged in for several decades, and we've associated it with a number of different pleasurable experiences that we have. But we're also physically dependent on nicotine. And there are very clear biological explanations for why it's extremely difficult to stop smoking. Um, unfortunately, most people who try to quit smoking do so without the use of, use of formal assistance. When people try to quit smoking, most often they try and quit on their own through a process that we all refer to as cold turkey and don't try and use medications or formal behavioral interventions. And that's one of the reasons why our success rates are so low. So what are the kinds of interventions that are useful to help people quit smoking? Well, we know talking with somebody about the process is helpful. So engaging 
engaging in some form of counseling with an individual who has experience working with smokers in the past is beneficial. And there are different kinds of formats that you can use. Uh, and this is data that shows the, the quit rates on the left and the different types of formats on the horizontal axis. And you can look at self-help, which, which just means that you're looking at a brochure or some kind of educational pamphlet that guides you through a process. Or you're involved in some form of telephone counseling. Or you're involved in some kind of more formal psychological counseling, either in the form of a group or, an in, or individual one-on-one. -on -one. And we know that individual counseling yields the highest quit rates, almost doubling the chance of quitting compared to no formal counseling. So 11% of people that just try to quit on their own are successful. About 17% of people that engage in a formal behavioral counseling intervention are successful. We also know that the more counseling people receive, the more counseling that they engage in, the more successful they are. So there are two pieces of information here. On the left, you see the amount of counseling people in experience in just minutes. And then on the, on the right-hand side is the number of sessions. And you can see a, what we call a nice linear relationship. That just means that the relationship goes in a very sort of, you know, consistently upwards uh, 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 direction here. So. Uh, compared to no contact, if you're engaging in sessions that last for more than 10 minutes, you're seeing a doubling of, of success rates from 11% to 22%. And if you're in one, zero to one session versus more than eight sessions, again, a doubling of uh, the, the likelihood that someone would quit smoking. This is typically referred to as the dose-response relationship. The greater the dose you get, the better your response is. And what is the nature of counseling that makes it so successful? Well, there are four main ingredients to successfully helping somebody quit smoking from a behavioral perspective. The first is recognizing dangerous situations. So there are events in our life, there are internal emotions that we feel, there are activities that we participate in that have over time been consistently associated with our with our smoking. And we need to identify what those situations are and learn strategies to deal with them in a more effective way. We need to also develop coping strategies. These are uh, uh, identifying and practicing uh, methods that we're going to use in these dangerous situations to help avoid smoking. And then a third ingredient is getting information, educating yourself about the cessation process, Understanding that when you try to quit smoking, you're going to experience a sense of withdrawal, but that withdrawal is very short-lived. And if you can push through the first three to seven days, the withdrawal symptoms dissipate significantly. So things of that nature, understanding the process of quitting and the benefit, the, the, the process of quitting and the benefits of quitting. And then finally, an important ingredient to successful uh, uh, behavioral intervention for quitting smoking is, is getting and relying on support. Seeking the help and assistance, the concern and the understanding of people around, around you and having them assist you in guiding you through the process. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, smoking, quitting smoking is difficult because it's got a psychological component to it from a learned habit, and it's also got a physiological component as, far, as part of the addiction. And to address the physiological component, it's necessary, in our view, to utilize some form of medication. So we have uh, three main types of medications that are approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for treating nicotine dependence. You've got the group of nicotine replacement therapies. You've got different types. You've got the nicotine patch and the nicotine gum, which many people are familiar with because they've been around for about 25 years now, and they're sold over the counter. There's a, a lozenge that you can use, like a hard candy. There's a nasal spray and an inhaler, both of those are less well known because they remain prescription medications and are not used nearly as broadly as, as the other forms of nicotine replacement therapy. And then we have two non-nicotine medications. One's called Zyban, which has also been around for a long period of time. And the other, it was just approved by the FDA in 2006 called Chantix. 
So this is information about, uh, about each of these medications in terms of recommended du uh, duration and dose and what the advantages and disadvantages are. Some of the advantages to, uh, to nicotine gum and uh, nicotine inhaler and nicotine nasal spray and lozenges is that they can be used to treat craving when you experience it. So if you're someone trying to quit smoking and you experience those intense feelings and desires to go back to smoking at specific time points, using a medication like, uh, like the gum or the lozenge or the inhaler or nasal spray, which can provide you with an immediate dose of medication, is a, a distinct advantage. Um, the patch has the advantage of offering you the ability to not have to remember to use your medication. You put it on in the morning and it stays on you for up to 24 hours. So compliance seems to be a better issue and there are fewer side effects. Uh, bupropion is uh, a medication that uh, one of the big advantages uh, of this medication is that it not only helps people quit smoking, but it helps to alleviate symptoms of depression. This is actually a medication that was first developed as an antidepressant. And there's a lot of overlap between feelings of depression and quitting smoking. When people quit smoking, there's an uptick in feelings of depression that can often trigger a relapse to going back to smoking. So bupropion is a medication that can help prevent one of the side effects of, of, of cessation that often leads to relapsing. Uh, Chantix, one of the big advantages of Chantix is that it uh, has sort of a dual function. It, it uh, on the one hand, helps to alleviate withdrawal and craving by stimulating the same kinds of mechanism that nicotine does, but it also prevents you from experiencing the same kind of rewards that you had from smoking because the medication itself occupies uh, the little receptors, these little locks throughout your, your central nervous system that nicotine fits into and triggers uh, rewarding experiences. So it can have a dual function purpose. It can prevent withdrawal from when you, when you quit smoking, and it can also prevent you from experiencing the, war, the rewarding pleasures from smoking if you should have a relapse. So in terms of looking at how these medications do, you have a question, ma'am? You want me to go back to the next slide? The last slide, I mean? Sure. An uh, e-cigarette, yeah. Right. So the question is, uh, is asking about the e-cigarette. So the, I'm restricting my discussion to medications that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration for treating nicotine dependence. E-cigarettes are not. The problems with the e-cigarettes um, are, are twofold. Um, first, they haven't been studied adequately. Uh, there haven't been any uh, carefully designed, rigorous scientific studies looking at how effective they are and how safe they are. Many of them are manufactured by consumer uh, 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 commercial industries that are, are not concerned uh, about the safety and efficacy of their product. They're just concerned about uh, selling as many of, these, uh, of the product as, as they can. So we don't know how much nicotine is uh, received and how much it can help alleviate withdrawal. We don't know whether in the long term there'll be an effective way of helping people quit smoking. And we don't know if they're safe for people. That's the first big issue, is that we really haven't studied them scientifically to know if they're safe and effective. The other issue is that um, the worry is, in the scientific community, that a product like that will undermine people's efforts to quit smoking. So the idea of the e-cigarette is that you can use it not only to quit smoking, but help to deal with situations where you're not allowed to smoke, like this room right here. So theoretically, the e-cigarette could be taken out and help somebody deal with the withdrawal and craving that they're experiencing by sitting in a room for a prolonged period of time and not being able to smoke. And that may undermine their ability to quit smoking or their commitment to quitting smoking in the long term. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so when we look at how effective, and we measure effectiveness by the proportion of people who use them that are able to quit smoking, 
we see that uh, that on the left hand side is a plus, is a placebo group. So this is this is a group not treating with a, not treated with an active medication. That about 14 percent of people are able to quit smoking. The patch 23 percent, gum 19 percent, lozenges 24 percent, nasal spray 27, inhaler 25, bupropion 24, and varenicline or Chantix uh, 33 percent. So each of the medications uh, leads to either uh, uh, about a 50 to uh, more than 100% uh, increased likelihood of quitting smoking, with varenicline being the most effective medication that we have available. But you should also hopefully say to yourself that even with these medications, only about, at best case scenario, th about three out of 10 people are able to quit smoking in the long term. So what are we doing to increase effectiveness? Well, there are a number of different lines of scientific research going on, some, of, some uh, at, at our institution. So uh, some people believe that the dose of nicotine replacement therapy isn't sufficient, so there are studies looking at increasing the dose. So far, there's little evidence that increasing the amount of nicotine in, an, in, a, in a nicotine replacement therapy provides better results. There are studies looking at combining nicotine replacement therapies, so using the patch to provide yourself with a steady dose of nicotine throughout the day, and then adding on to that uh, one of the acute dosing medications like uh, 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 the lozenge or, or the gum when you have uh, real severe bouts of craving. And there's good evidence to suggest that combining nicotine replacement therapies is more effective than just using one. We don't really have a lot of evidence that one form of nicotine replacement therapy is better than the other. And we also don't have much evidence to suggest that combining nicotine replacement therapy with bupropion is more effective. And there's no data I should also add looking at combining nicotine replacement therapy with varenicline. There's some evidence that says that if you start using nicotine replacement therapy while you're still smoking in sort of a pre-cessation phase uh, versus starting it on the day that you target as your quit date can be more effective than just using it on your quit date. But there are some concerns about having too much nicotine in your, in your system uh, while you're uh, smoking at the same time. But there's some evidence, if that's a safe approach, that it can be more effective. And then there's some evidence that keeping people on nicotine replacement therapy for longer periods of time most of, them, most of the products are recommended for use only 8 to 12 weeks, but it's unrealistic to expect that someone who's been smoking for 30 or 40 years is going to come into our clinic and, and use a medication for just 8 to 12 weeks and be able to successfully maintain their abstinence in the long term. So we've done studies and other people have done studies as well looking at extending the use of these medications over time, and there's evidence to suggest that keeping people on therapy for longer periods of time helps improve quit rates. So I want to make the point that uh, it's critical to add behavioral counseling to medication. And here you see the quit rates on the left, uh, just using, on average, the, a, a medication. About 22% are able to quit smoking. And for those who use medication and counseling, it increases to 28%. And then. Finally, um, if there are smokers in the audience or if you're here because a family member or a friend is a smoker and you want to help them uh, get help, then here's uh, a couple of options for you. So you can call us at Penn, and here's our number. Uh, or there's a national quit line, and you have access to it in Pennsylvania, and the number's there. So I want to thank you for your, for your attention. Again, I'll leave my uh, cards up on the desk there should anyone want to contact me. And I wish you good luck. Thank you. Uh, I'll introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's Dr. Frank Leone. And he's going to come up and talk with us about it's time to stop making smokers feel guilty. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Hello. Good morning. My name's Frank. I'm a, a lung doctor. I'm a pulmonologist at Penn. And uh, I have a clinic where I see lots of patients with you know, different kinds of lung illness, lung cancer included, and, but mostly my interest is in smoking. What, like, why does it happen? How does it work? How do we help people stop? What's going on that keeps per a person smoking? So I thought 
I might try and bring a little bit of my experience with folks who suffer with smoking to the room and maybe we can start a little discussion. Now I want to warn you, this is important now, you ready? This is my favorite thing to talk about in the world. I go home from work at night, my kids are at the table, they want to tell me how things went at school today. I say, hey, be quiet, I got stuff to say. See what I'm saying? So now, what I need from you is I need some questions to slow me down just a little bit, okay? If you have questions, you bring them up. I'm gonna say some stuff that maybe doesn't make sense compared to things that you've been hearing outside. If something I say doesn't make sense, I want you to challenge me. Fair enough? All right, here we go. So here's this woman. I don't even know who this woman is, honestly. I just stole this picture off the internet. She's a nice lady, I'm sure. I call her Mary just for a shortcut, you see. Mary, to me, actually represents a symbol of the kinds of patients that I see. But more than that, actually, Mary is a symbol to you. Mary symbolizes to people who look at her someone that they care about. Might be themselves, might be someone in the family, might be a patient, might be a relative, might be a friend or a coworker, someone who's suffering from smoking-related illness. And here we see Mary's got her oxygen on, so we know it's very serious. Maybe Mary's got COPD, emphysema, that kind of thing. Mary, maybe Mary's got heart disease. Maybe Mary's got lung cancer. Who knows? But what we know about Mary is that despite the fact that it's very serious and she means very much to us, she continues to smoke. Now, who here has never met someone who smokes who sort of frustrates them just a little bit about why are they continuing to smoke? What's going on? What's the, I mean, it's a very sort of frustrating sort of thing. No matter how much you care, you care so much, and yet it's so serious. And yet the smoking's still in there. And it's a frustrating and confusing sort of thing. So we gotta ask ourselves, why is it that Mary keeps smoking? Dr. Schnoll will talk, huh? Yeah, and that's something, that's something, yeah. I see folks all like, like, the question is, Mary smoking with the oxygen on, and I see folks like this a lot. You know, it's something, because there she is, it's very serious, she's wearing oxygen, you've got the tank, and yet it's very, it's very important for her to continue smoking. And so what most people do is they make the assumption that there's something missing in Mary's life. She doesn't have enough motivation. She doesn't care enough. She doesn't know enough. They make that assumption when they see Mary smoke. But in fact, I'm going to suggest to you that if we decide up front, if we assume up front that Mary loves her kids and her grandchildren just as much as we do. Mary enjoys living just as much as we do. Mary doesn't like to be walking around with oxygen, oxygen just as much as we do. It's not about a deficit of something. It's about something that keeps her from giving up the cigarettes. You see what I mean? You see that? That's a, that's a very critical difference. It's not about something missing. It's about too much of something that keeps her from giving up the cigarettes. And we gotta try and understand what that too much of something really is. Dr. Snow talked a little bit about the nature of addiction with nicotine. This is a graphical representation of the molecule of nicotine. That's the chemical that is in the cigarettes that keeps us smoking. But it's very important really to understand exactly how nicotine does its business. How does it keep Mary smoking? Ah, Dr. Vachani showed us some x-rays this morning of lungs with lung cancer and all that stuff on it. And I would put out there, nothing personal, Anil, but what I would do is I would put out there that this x-ray is actually probably the most important x-ray to understand the genesis of lung cancer, at least in the United States. Can anybody guess what this is an x-ray of? Anyone? Take a, take a guess. Well, not quite lung cancer. Ah, it is a brain. What's the, uh, what's the animal this is a brain of? In? Looks almost like a bird, got the big teeth. See the big teeth? Can you think of another animal maybe that's got big teeth? This is a rat. This is an x-ray of a rat's brain. And take a look at this. Up here in that rat's brain, you see that? Almost looks like Martian antenna, whatever. Those tiny little wires that people put in rat brains and figure out how the rat brain works. And one day in 1954, 1954, think about it, 1954, a couple guys putting wires in rats' brains, they made a mistake, an accident in the lab, 
And that accident turned into the discovery that there's a special spot in the brain that makes us do stuff that we prefer not to do. So for example, they could teach this rat all kinds of tricks. They can make this rat do whatever they needed to do by stimulating that special spot in the brain. And probably by 1956 or 57, they had actually figured out that it's not just about wires in the brain, but different chemicals could actually create the same effect. Nicotine is one of those chemicals. And nicotine can make us do stuff we would rather not do. And it does it this way. I was in the park, right? I'm riding my bike, some friends. We come across this guy walking his dog. We see him every week. He hadn't been there for a while. So I said, hey, how you been? Oh, OK. My dog had surgery on his knee. I was shocked. I didn't know they did surgery on dog knees. Did you know that? No. I didn't either. So I'm like, well, what, what's it all about? You got surgery on your dog's knee. Like, how's the dog doing? He said, oh, they did this, they did that. The dog was in pain, but he's feeling a lot better now. He said, my dog got physical therapy. Whoa, I was surprised. So I asked a simple question. I said, do you feel like the dog's still in pain? He said, it's difficult to tell because the dog takes it easy while we're walking around. But goodness gracious, if he sees a rabbit, boom, he's off. He's running after the rabbit. See, he explains. He says, that's his instincts, you see. You can't control instincts. It's hard to control instincts. And everybody in the group was like, yeah, hard to control instincts. And that's when it hit me. It hit me. This, that's how the brain is actually working. Here's that little special spot in the brain that we looked at with that x-ray just a little while ago. It's a spot. It's called the ventral tegmental area. The name isn't all that important. What's important to recognize is that this is a spot that functions as a safety thermostat, an instinct center, a survival instinct center in the brain. This is the spot in the brain when the dog sees the rabbit, when the outside world out here makes its way into the brain and the ventral tegmental area figures out that there's a rabbit outside, the ventral tegmental area says, hey, focus on that. Go get it. And in order to get the instincts to go after the rabbit, the ventral tegmental area talks to the emotion part of the brain to make the dog all agitated and anxious and happy and excited and aggressive. And it talks to the motivation part of the brain over here to get the dog up off its legs, off its hind leg, and running after the dog, no matter how much the owner's screaming, hey, stop, come back here. What happens is, as it turns out, nicotine, the way nicotine works, is when it gets on that ventral tegmental area, it convinces that little safety thermostat that it's a safety signal, you see? And it creates a sense of gratification, safety, comfort, warmth, love, happiness, correctness. And that correctness factor gets translated out to the emotion part of the brain where the person feels like, all right, it's like a hug. I'm OK. This is good. I feel better. And it gets translated out to the motivation part of the brain that says, yeah, smoking this was the right thing to do. And what's most important is when the bright idea part of the brain up here says, you know what, it's really time to stop. I got to stop smoking. That safety thermostat says, wait a minute, what are you doing? You taking that nicotine away from me? And the emotion part of the brain says, ooh, I don't know. And the motivation part of the brain says, OK, you quit smoking any time you want after the next cigarette. And so that after the next cigarette phenomenon goes on for 20, 30 years, where people know they got to stop, they want to stop, they're desperate to stop. Mary's not, she knows she's got to stop. But at the same time, something instinctive in their belly, in their soul is saying, not today, just not today. And that's a problem. Now we got folks who are stuck, right? We got folks who are stuck. Mary is not missing something. Mary is unfortunately stuck. And so if we understand her to be stuck, we want to understand exactly how to help her get unstuck. The first thing we got to try and recognize in order to get her unstuck is to figure out exactly how it is that the cigarettes 
actually tickling that safety thermostat spot in the brain that we talked about. And it turns out that that safety thermostat spot in the brain really requires signals in a very particular pattern. It requires, you start off with chemical um, signaling chemicals that start off at very low levels, background levels, and rise in levels very quickly. The concentrations of those chemicals need to go up very quickly to very high levels. And then they're sort of mixing, remixing, and it kind of comes back down towards the baseline. Okay, that's ba the basic pattern that the brain needs to see in order to get that safety signal. Now watch this, this is cool. You ready? I'm gonna show you here, this is actual data. See the closed squares here? That is arterial levels of nicotine going to the brain, on their way to the brain, produced using a cigarette as a delivery device. I'm gonna start off here at time zero. Background nicotine levels are extremely low. You see that? Couple puffs off the cigarette, and look what happens to the arterial levels of nicotine after you take that cigarette. You see how high that gets? That's pretty amazing. And then within a, a few short minutes, that nicotine level comes back down towards that new baseline. And not just as an example, I wanna show you, if you do the same exact experiment, but instead of using the cigarette as a delivery device, you use the inhaler instead. See, arterial levels going to the brain, nicotine levels produced using the inhaler, open squares. Starts off very low, just the same way. A few puffs off the inhaler, and look how anemic that little, that little bump is. Okay, it's not the same. The cigarette is actually extremely important in creating the impact for nicotine. The cigarette is important as a delivery device. And I'm gonna tell you just a quick little story. I know my time is short, but I wanna tell you this other story. This is something. You say to yourself, well, how is it that the inhaler only gives you just like a little bit, but the cigarette gets these levels that are so high? Well, it turns out that that difference is not an accident. That is not an accident. That is someone, some engineer, in the 1960s and 70s, figuring out the variables which influence that peak level. It turns out that there's little holes in the filter paper around cigarettes that change just how much fresh air is drawn in whenever you take a puff off a cigarette. It turns out that the temperature at the tip that's lit is very precisely regulated within a couple of degrees because temperature influences how much nicotine is delivered. And here's a good one. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? Are you sitting down for this? When they build a cigarette, they add ammonia. And you say, hey, Philip Morris, why are you adding ammonia? And they say it's a flavorant. Is there anyone in the room who enjoys the flavor of ammonia? No. They did not pick chocolate, which I could have understood. They picked ammonia. It turns out that when you heat nicotine in the presence of ammonia, what comes out in the smoke is what the chemists refer to as the free base form of nicotine. Have you ever heard the word free base before? Sounds an awful lot like crack, doesn't it? That's exactly right. It is exactly the same reason why cocaine is addictive, but crack cocaine is a catastrophe. Nicotine is addictive, but crack nicotine is a catastrophe. The cigarette is engineered to, to deliver high proportions of crack nicotine. And as a consequence, those instincts are constantly saying, quit anytime you want, just not today. 20 years, 30 years. 40 years. The cigarette as a highly engineered crack nicotine delivery device. Mary is not missing something. Mary doesn't need to be motivated. Mary needs to understand how, why she can't find it in her to stop today. And it's because the cigarette is a crack nicotine delivery device. Okay, so Mary you know, nicotine addiction is really a disorder of what's referred to as compulsion. Patients are really not exactly ready, willing, or able. They're hesitant. They want to change, but they don't want to change. I had a patient once tell me, and I thought this was almost poetry. You ready? She said, I desperately want to want to quit smoking. I thought that was beautiful. 
She desperately wants to want to quit smoking, but not quite sure she really wants to quit smoking. Ambivalence. Come back when you're ready. We talk to people all the time. We tell them, unfortunately, we say to them, I can't do anything for you until you're ready. But in the, in the face of instincts telling you one thing and your brain telling you the other, your mind telling you the other, when are you going to be ready? It takes a long time. Unfortunately, usually people get ready after some health consequence, and that's not what we're looking for here. Who wants to quit anyway? It's my only advice. I love this slide, you know, there's lots of jokes associated with this slide. It's a bad habit, blah, blah, blah. This is some of my best stuff here, folks, so if you're not going to laugh now, okay? It's <laughs> the truth is, is that if you think about Mary and you want to try and help her, you got to figure out the, the following idea. This is a very important idea. This, the decision to keep smoking or whether or not a person keeps smoking is really the balance between the motivations to, to uh, stop, what motivates us to stop, balanced against the disincentives to stop. And what we generally do as concerned folks, doctors, family members, co-workers, all of us, we generally take this approach. We generally say we want to try and motivate Mary to quit smoking. So we talk to her about all the things that are going wrong. We point out the fact that she's on oxygen. But in fact, those instincts, it's just like the dog, the instincts are very difficult to change. And so the instincts to not quit today are really heavy. And so if we want to help Mary move the needle, so to speak, what we really need to do is try and help her relieve some of the impact, some of the influence of those instincts. The fear, the nervousness, the anxiety, the agitation, the frustration, the ambivalence associated with those instincts to keep smoking. That has to be relieved. All the medications that Dr. Schnoll talked about, they all essentially do, they all essentially work by calming some of the instincts that keep a person smoking, allowing Mary to use her logic and reason to help her quit smoking. And so if you want to think about how to approach a patient or someone, someone you love, someone you care about, about smoking, in my mind, the answer is not in terms of uh, ramping up the motivation. In my mind, the answer is in terms of acknowledging how much motivation they must already have and actually looking for things that we can do to make the disincentives less powerful. Do you see what I mean? Do you see my... Is there any questions on that so far? It's important. It's important. We're not going to push down our motivation. We're going to try and lighten the load of instincts. And so the balance shifts in the same direction that we want it to go. Do you see what I mean? And so if you're thinking about what to say or how to say it, you got to think about the source first. If you read the sort of marketing literature when you build an advertising campaign, you have to think about who you are as the source of the message and what your relationship is to that smoker in order to figure out what the most appropriate messages ought to be. And there, the key phrase here is that perceptions of the person or group sending the message are the most important factors determining whether or not the message is received. And so you have to understand who you are first to that smoker and use that understanding to get the appropriate message across. First, credibility. Do they believe us? Do they trust us? Do they trust that we, in the end, really do have their back? If the trust factor is not quite there, you have to work on trust first. Without trust, none of the rest of it follows. Second, attractiveness. Do they want to see us? Mary doesn't really want to talk about quitting. That's the nature of the problem. So we have to find a way to be attractive, to be able to help her talk about this just a little bit without fear, without uh, uh, sort of moral indignation. Power, will they be treated with respect? They're in a very vulnerable position. They're stuck. Crack nicotine. They are stuck and they know it and they've been stuck for 20, 30, 40 years. And they are at risk for getting lung cancer. They want to know whether or not we're willing to treat them with respect as human beings instead of just someone who we feel probably didn't get it. And second, homophily. I love that word. Isn't that an awesome word? It's got the word Philly in it. See it? Homophily, that's Latin. That's Latin for love of sameness. That just means that people generally connect with people who they see as similar to them. 
You see what I mean? We kind of think of, when we're trying to make new friends, we think about people in similar situations and we feel a sense of hominess or connection just based on love of sameness. Can they see themselves? Can the smokers see themselves associating with us? And I'll give you an example. This is what Philip Morris really recognizes is that, the, you know, what they're selling. They're really doing all the sort of respect and trust, they're selling a completely different idea. They're not saying, buy my product based on price or that it tastes the best. They're selling a notion. They're selling people walking in the woods, beautiful sunny day, togetherness, happiness. Who among us doesn't want to be wherever this is right now? In the sunny patch. <laughs> right in the sunny patch. Right, right in the sunny patch. So they recognize that they're not really selling you facts. They're selling you sort of an emotional idea. They're trying to connect to you. They're trying to make you feel comfortable, feel warm, happy, safe, all the same ways that you'd like to feel when you're using the cigarette. This, on the other hand, is an example of an advertisement that's used by lots of public health agencies around town, around the country, where we tend to emphasize all the illness that's associated with smoking. And so I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting to you that this is necessarily a bad message, but it may be a, be a great message for public health folks who want to get the word out that smoking's no good. Huh? The thing on the neck? Oh, so this is a, a picture who, of a patient who's had throat cancer, and they had to take his voice box out. And so this is one of those things that makes that vibrating noise so that he can make sound when he talks, yeah. That's how he talks now. So I am suggesting that if it's somebody that you care about, who you want to talk to about smoking, perhaps this is not the place we ought to learn our perspective from. Perhaps we ought to really think about trust and that power imbalance and credibility and homophily. Isn't that awesome? I love that word. Uh, we've been experimenting with a few ads. We put a few things out on the internet, see how they work, try and get a sense of how people respond to them. Actually, I'm going to ask you guys to give me a little feedback on some of these this morning, okay? So I'm going to show you a few messages that we're trying to shake things up just a little bit from the traditional way of actually approaching smokers. And maybe you can help me understand. We came up with a couple of taglines, just a couple of quick ads. Our only uh, requirement was that the ads embody some of these four magic words. We wanted them to embody the sense of empathy, the idea that we kind of get where the smoker's coming from. We understand their position. Validation, that it's actually understandable that they've continued to smoke for such a long time. Joining, that it's you and me. We're together on this. We're going to work together to solve this problem. I'm here for you. And hope that the problem is actually solvable. Okay, we can get you out from being stuck. And here's one of the ads, and this is, a, this is an internet thing, so you see these sort of top lines that are bolded? When they come up, the top line comes up first, and then this one appears just like a half a second later. So it's like, where there's smoke, there's someone who'd appreciate a little understanding. You see that? There's someone who'd appreciate a little understanding. The idea here is that we're really trying to advocate on behalf of the person who's a smoker, trying to understand their point of view, trying to get people to stop, whoo, you know, on them, and really try and fix the problem. What if, a quit, uh, what if a quit smoking program didn't pressure you to quit smoking? That's very unusual, wouldn't you say? You have a right to give up smoking when you want to. It's time to quit making smokers feel guilty. So by show of hands, who likes where there's smoke, there's someone who'd appreciate a little understanding? Who thinks that's a useful ad? All right, that's cool. I like that, that's great. That looks like a pretty good. What if a quit smoking program didn't press you to quit smoking? Raise your hand, who likes that as an idea? Perfect, you have a right to give up smoking when you want to. Who likes that? Excellent. And how about the last one? It's time to quit making smokers feel guilty. Who likes that? 
Okay. These are unusual messages. They run counter to the types of messages we're used to seeing. What I'm doing is I'm really trying to offer these ideas out to you as alternative ways of dealing with this problem. If it's someone that you care about, I want you to feel like you're their greatest advocate. You're out there to help them. You understand the problem. You need to communicate the fact that you understand the problem to them and that there's nothing more important to you than, they, than their safety, comfort, warmth, and security. Finally, we love smokers, we hate smoking. That's me. See, that, that's not, that is not Brad Pitt, that is me. Oh, this is a tough crowd, I'll tell you. And then my final slide, I, I try to end most talks with this saying, because I like it a lot with respect to smoking. We've been sort of doing the same shtick now for the people that we care about for, I don't know, maybe like 100 years. And I feel like unless we rethink exactly what we're doing, we're going to get the same results. If we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always gotten. All right, I'll take any questions you guys have. Who's got questions? We're, so we have a couple. All right, awesome. We got a couple of numbers. There's going to be some material left behind for you guys. You got some numbers you can call and sign up. We'll get you enrolled and we'll get you off, off to the races, okay? You're welcome. Any other questions? Right. Yeah, so, so the question is, there's a lot of cigarettes that don't have additives. Is there any way that that's better? Number one, there's no evidence that no additives, light cigarettes, any of these other sort of marketing schemes, low carcinogen cigarettes actually do anything to protect you against risk. Risk is a function of dose and exposure of the lungs. And so people uh, control how much they expose their lungs to smoke by changing how deep they drag, how many drags, that kind of stuff. So there's no evidence that that kind of manipulation really changes anything. Is it nicotine that causes the cancer, or is it just the, the like, whole process of smoking? Right. The second question is, is it the nicotine that causes the cancer? It is not the nicotine that causes the cancer. That's the really interesting thing about this problem. The nicotine actually turns out to be safe, and you could theoretically be taking nicotine for your entire life and really not have to worry about problems. It's the fact that the nicotine is packaged inside of smoke that actually ends up causing the problems. In order to get the nicotine, Mary has to expose herself to smoke. And so a lot of these medications that Dr. Schnoll was talking about use as a first step substituting. I'm going to give you a safe source of nicotine. Keep the brain feeling happy. Eliminate exposure to smoke. Yes, ma'am. Right. 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 Sure. It is hard. It's a. It, right. So, so there are two things. First of all, it is hard to quit smoking, but it doesn't have to be. And so what we've been taught over the years is that if we're going to quit smoking, we need to suffer a little bit in order to get it out of our system. And that's wrong. In fact, it turns out that the less you suffer, the easier it is, the better it is, the easier it is to quit smoking, the less likely there are going to be side effects withdrawal symptoms, weight gain, that kind of stuff. And so what I would encourage you to actually start demanding better service and say, here, I've been trying this and it's only working 20% of what I want it to work. Who's going to give me that other 80%? Where am I getting it from? Talk to your doctor. Come give us a call. We'll talk to you about the options. You need, you guys, smokers, need to start feeling like you're first class citizens and that you deserve to be comfortable you deserve to be safe. You deserve to have this instinct turned off without having to expose yourself to smoke in order to get that done. You see that distinction? 
All right. I get, uh, you know, I, there's, I would love to talk to you guys, but we have a couple of talks we want to try and do. So I'll stick around. If there's other questions later on, we'll, we're going to have like a little thing up here, okay? Nice talking with you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Frank. Always inspiring. All right, our next uh, speaker, I feel sorry for her following Frank after that. <laughs> uh, Janet O'Dray McGovern, a uh, colleague of mine in the Department of Psychiatry, she's going to talk with us about adolescent smoking prevention. Thanks. I just want to say I hate following Frank, but I've had some caffeine, so I think I'm good. I'm going to talk about where it all begins. Where, where the smoking, the lifelong smoking habit starts, and that's adolescence. And um, I can sympathize with uh, those of you who are thinking about quitting and you're talking about it being very difficult. Uh, I began smoking as an adolescent, and I had a good 20 years of smoking before I was able to quit, and I had to try several times. So um, some of the information that I'm going to provide uh, to you this morning is um, going to relate back to what Robbie and, and uh, Frank have spoken about. Um, when you um, uh, begin something in adolescent, you expose the adolescent brain to nicotine, you've then uh, exposed a vulnerable brain to a very addictive substance, which um, may help you then understand why it's so hard to give up. Can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Okay, so as uh, we've heard this morning, uh, smoking is the, um, uh, the biggest contributor to uh, premature disease and dying. And it outranks um, uh, obesity, inactivity, um, and other factors that we uh, tend to think about when we think about someone uh, uh, dying too soon. As Robbie noted, there are about um, 400,000 uh, smokers who, who die each year of a disease related to their smoking. Well, each and every year, those individuals who pass away due to a smoking attributable disease are replaced by new smokers. So over 2,000 adolescents start smoking regularly every day. And that's not just experimenting with, uh, with tobacco. They're smoking at least one cigarette a day. So they're um, uh, replacing those smokers who have died. So the tobacco industry is very invested in making sure that they continue to have a, a market for their product. This translates into over one million, almost a million and a half new smokers every year. This um, figure uh, means that about one fifth or 20% of adolescents are current smokers. And why, why is adolescent smoking so important? Well, the majority of adults who have ever smoked regularly began smoking during adolescence. And many of them were smoking regularly, meaning that they smoked daily prior to the age of 18. So we feel that preventing adolescents from beginning to smoke is critical to preventing that premature disease and the premature uh, dying that's associated with cigarette smoking. Um, in order to help prevent adolescent smoking, we need to be able to identify the factors that um, not only promote adolescent smoking, but protect adolescents from ever beginning to, uh, to smoke regularly. So the research that we do is focused on identifying those important ingredients to include in a smoking prevention program so we can do a better job um, uh, preventing that next generation of smokers. Now, when I talk about adolescence, I'm talking about mid-adolescence to late adolescence, so age 14 to age 18. This is when adolescents are most vulnerable to begin smoking. And this is when the majority of adolescents actually uh, start smoking regularly. So this is a very important period. And if you think about these figures, this is high school. And we know that um, the greatest increase in smoking occurs across the high school years. So the number of um, uh, current smokers can, uh, can double, the number of frequent smokers can triple. This is a very key period. So given that this is a vulnerable period in time, what 
has been done to prevent adolescent smoking and where has it been done? Many of the programs are school-based and they focus on giving adolescents information. This includes the information about the, uh, the health risks of smoking. Um, schools also have used uh, social uh, influences or, or skill building programs. So for example, if somebody offers you a cigarette, how do you refuse that cigarette? Um, how do you focus on making good decisions? Um, decisions that um, when, you, when you weigh the pros and the cons, you make the right choice. There have also been community-based programs, including uh, controlling cigarette uh, access, such as uh, limiting um, uh, the number and the location of vending machines, making it much more difficult for an adolescent to purchase uh, tobacco products in a convenience store or anywhere else. Media campaigns, um, we call that uh, anti-tobacco uh, advertising. And the truth campaign that was out um, uh, the last decade and some of the other uh, tobacco, anti-tobacco advertising that, that uh, has followed uh, would be under that category. Also involving parents in preventing their adolescents or their teens from smoking. We know that if parents um, uh, approach smoking in a particular way, even if they're smokers themselves, they will give adolescents, the, their teens, the right message that smoking is not what you want to do. Um, the, uh, as far as uh, other things that ha uh, have tried to reach adolescent smokers, there have been um, things in the community, such as health fairs, that have uh, tried to focus on preventing adolescents from beginning to smoke. Given uh, these different strategies, what has seemed to have the, uh, the biggest impact on adolescent smoking? Well, we know that having face-to-face -face contact is important. In the, uh, in the age of, um, of uh, telephones and, uh, and uh, internet and other non-face-to-face -face, uh, strategies, we know that for adolescents that face-to-face -face interaction matters and that um, actually role-playing some of those skills, like this is how I'll, if somebody came up to me and said, hey, would you like a cigarette or hey, you want to go smoke with us, this is what I would do. And they practice doing what they would do in order to refuse that cigarette. Um, social influences approaches, as I mentioned earlier, include um, giving adolescents those life skills that are going to not only help them to not um, uh, accept that cigarette offer, but also to make good decisions, to be assertive, uh, ways to manage their stress such they don't turn to unhealthy ways to do that. Um, now, the, the um, prevention approaches that have used the um, media influences uh, have also been very helpful. Also those that counter smoking norms among adolescents. Adolescents tend to think, oh, I, why shouldn't I smoke? Everyone else is doing it. So adolescents have this idea that if everyone else is doing it, I should do it too. But the, those perceptions of what everybody else is doing um, tend to be incorrect. So if adolescents know that everyone's not doing it, they'll be less likely to, to do it. Um, the life skills include problem solving, decision making, assertiveness, uh, as I uh, mentioned previously. Also, when adolescents are um, um, taught some of these skills by uh, their peers or, or adolescents that are about the same age, it tends to be, have a stronger message, a stronger impact than if, if these programs were just delivered by an adult. Now, what doesn't work? Well, we know that um, just providing information on health risks doesn't work. So if you um, have a health class and you say, you know, smoking is bad, these are the diseases smoking causes, um, these are the, uh, the, the social uh, uh, difficulties that uh, you'll experience if you smoke, you won't be able to smoke in particular buildings, um, those types of things, that doesn't work, as you can imagine. You'll be talking to the wall. If you have a few number of sessions and you only have them in early adolescence, that doesn't really help either. This is a huge problem during adolescence. This is when the majority of people start smoking. They start their smoking career. Less than 15 um, um, 
um, lessons is, is it not going to be helpful. And if you only do that in early adolescence, say even before the age of 14, then you may only impact those adolescents that would um, start smoking early. But you don't have any sort of impact on those that will start smoking later. So you've missed a, a whole other group that you could have had a, an effect on. Um, so when pr the prevention programs are delivered in the classroom by the, their typical classroom teacher, they tend not to be helpful. When you have one day special events, or when you have poster competitions or lotteries. So if you don't start smoking, you will you know, win an iPod. Those aren't helpful, because as Frank mentioned, this is a very complex problem. You aren't getting to the root of how it all begins if you do simple things like that. So the research shows that um, even our most effective approaches are only gonna help half of the adolescents that will ever begin smoking. So how do we make it better? How do we prevent 1.4 million new smokers every year? How do we do that? We need to think more about the timing. When should these prevention interventions happen? What should be included in them? And who should we target? It may be that one size doesn't fit all. When we think about adolescent smoking, we tend to uh, approach the prevention of this behavior in a very um, uh, kind of a, you know average vanilla way. Uh, we're going to start these programs in early adolescence, and then by the time mid adolescence comes, they'll have the message not to smoke. But that doesn't take into consideration that adolescents start smoking at different times, and they smoke at different rates. And they're smoking maybe, uh, they may be smoking one year, they're not smoking the next year, they may pick it up again. And we need to consider that adolescents differ and that we need to take this in consideration if we're gonna prevent that problem from ever beginning. Up until now, uh, the components of our smoking prevention programs have pretty much relied on giving adolescents the skills to refuse cigarettes, and giving adolescents the skills to make good decisions. But as we heard today, nicotine and smoking, that's a rewarding behavior. So if you're looking for rewarding uh, things to do, or even things to do in general, then you may know how to turn down that cigarette. You may know what the best decision is, but you're not going to, um, you're not gonna do that, you're not gonna choose that. What we found in our research if, is adolescents who are involved in other rewarding things are, are half as likely to not only take up smoking, but progress to regular smoking. And well, what are those other rewarding things? They can be um, uh, clubs, they can be academic involvement, they can be you know, church and community involvement. Here I show a slide of uh, physical activity. Physical activity is another rewarding behavior, and it can compete with smoking. So adolescents who um, remain physically active, as we can see with the white line here, they are less likely to begin smoking. Adolescents who have decreasing physical activity or have low levels of physical activity are um, about 25 to 30 percent more likely to smoke. And then they also, along the way, develop the, the belief that smoking is going to do something positive for them. Smoking is going to help me manage my stress. Smoking is going to make me look cool. Smoking is going to help me relax. Smoking is going to help me manage my weight. Those are all things that um, expectations that adolescents be begin to uh, develop. So not only do we need to give adolescents the skills to, um, uh, to not uh, uh, accept that uh, cigarette offer or you know, not make that choice to smoke that cigarette, but we need to give them alternatives. If you say no to cigarettes, what can you say yes to? Now, up in, and as I mentioned previously, up until now, we have um, 
treated all adolescents as if, as if they were the same, as if they had the same risk factors uh, to begin smoking, and we know that that's not true. So if we want more effective prevention approaches, then we need to con take into consideration those factors that we know increase an adolescent's likelihood of taking up smoking. Depression is one of those risk factors. So adolescents who, um, uh, and this is not even clinical depression, this is just some depression symptoms. Adolescents who have some depression symptoms, as noted by the dash red line, not only begin smoking earlier, but they progress to regular smoking faster and they smoke more than adolescents who are not depressed. One of the reasons why we um, we believe this other than biological reasons, is they um, respond more strongly to smoking ads. So the ad that, uh, that Frank showed where uh, if you smoke Cambridge, you too can take a walk in the sun and you'll have your patch of sun when you smoke Cambridge. Well, adolescents um, key into that message because when you're not happy and you don't have enjoyable things or you don't derive pleasure from those things that adolescents typically do, then smoking looks more appealing. So some of those ads that um, depict you know, attractive people looking very successful, um, having resources such like a, you know, a sailboat or a fancy car, that's very appealing to adolescents who uh, have uh, uh, depressed mood or, or anhedonia. Um, so when we think about you know, what we need to do to impact this 1.4 million new smokers every year, creating uh, interventions that are, that are tailored to some of these risk factors are probably gonna have a bigger impact, noting that one size does not fit all. So you know, as, a, as a parent, as a, uh, a practitioner, uh, from what we know right now, what can we do to help chip away at that number of uh, new smokers every day? One of the things that you can do is ask about smoking. Ask your teen, you know, uh, have you ever smoked? Are you smoking? Make sure you uh, start early and, and ask them um, about smoking throughout their teen years. Let them know that you disapprove, because if you don't let them know that you disapprove, then they're going to think that you approve. And if you smoke, that's all the more important to let them know that you disapprove. So, don't, so you want to give them the message, don't do what I'm doing. One of the other ways that, uh, that you can give that message um, um, at, at even a, a stronger level is um, do some of the things that we call anti-smoking parenting. So even if you're a smoking parent, you don't smoke in the car, you don't smoke in the house, so your teen then sees you having to go outside in the rain, in the cold, to smoke your cigarette. That gives them the message that, yeah, smoking's pretty inconvenient. This is a pretty awful habit to have because you have to go out there in the rain to smoke. Um, also, getting your teen involved in other rewarding uh, activities, physical activity, clubs, uh, academics, community groups, things that not only they can find rewarding, but um, as some parents think, it, it, it helps keep them out of trouble. Also, watch for depression, because if your you know, adolescent begins to, uh, uh, to look down, uh, complain that nothing interests them, or you notice changes in, uh, in their sleep or their appetite, uh, or just uh, moodiness, that, that, may, um, that may highlight uh, some depression symptoms that, that may make them more vulnerable to uh, poor decisions, including uh, smoking. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Is that what you want? <laughs> Well, I think you not only have to have a conversation, so you have to talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. 
So they not only have to hear you, um, you know, I started smoking when I was young, and this was a, uh, you know, a bad decision on my part. I did become addicted. I didn't think I would, and, and now I've smoked for, for umpteen years. Uh, I don't want you to follow the same path. I, um, I, I don't want you to smoke, and, um, so, and, and this is why. Um, but also, the behavior is important, especially if you smoke. So um, the, um, the, the not smoking in the car, um, not smoking in the house, not letting others smoke in your house, but they have to smoke outside. That gives them the message that, um, that, that smoking's not okay, and even my, um, my parent, who is a smoker, is um, having to put a lot of work into, into this habit. Um, and I think also, um, when you are a parent and you're quitting smoking and sharing some of these struggles with your teens so they can appreciate how difficult it is to break this habit and that it's better not to ever start it, um, will having that discussion in the context of, of quitting will be much more uh, meaningful and, and salient. And I don't think there's anything that would come across as hypocritical uh, in that because it's much more than a simple statement saying, don't do what I do. Okay, gang, we're gonna change gears slightly. I know some uh, folks expressed some interest in hearing about screening for lung cancer, and this is a, a very interesting area as there's some new studies to hear about and some new recommendations to hear about. So I'm going to introduce Drew Cherigian, who is a, an attending physician in our radiology department at Penn. He was the local principal investigator for the study that looked at lung cancer screening that was, that was published last year, and we're going to go through that and what that means to, to you. So come on up, Drew. Thank you. Hello, everybody. If you have any questions, feel to ask any time. Before I begin, I want to just give some disclosures. I've received some funding from the American College of Radiology Imaging Network, which was responsible for funding the National Lung Screening Trial, along with some other studies that I'm also participating in, one of which is lung cancer related. And also I got some funding related to a PET imaging study of lung cancer from the Radiological Society of North America. So what is the rationale for lung cancer screening? Well, as you've heard, lung cancer is common and it's deadly. It's the second most common cancer in the United States and the most common uh, cause of cancer death in the United States as well. The outcome depends on how advanced that disease is. And therefore, it was thought that if you can detect the cancer early, then maybe your outcomes would be better. As you've also heard, smoking is an epidemic. About one in five adults in the United States smokes. That's about 46 million people. One in five deaths in the United States relate to smoking. It's also the number one risk factor for lung cancer of which 85% of the lung cancer deaths are related to smoking. It's also the most common cause of preventable death in the United States. And altogether, there are about 94 million people who are smokers, current or former, in the United States, and therefore who are at risk, increased risk for lung cancer. Therefore, um, something to be done about it was the National Lung Screening Trial, or NLST. And this was a prospective, randomized controlled trial which enrolled about 50,000 people, maybe a little bit over that. And the way it was designed is that half of the people were enrolled in the CT group. So that means they got a CT scan every year for three years in a row. And this was done with a low radiation dose technique. The other half of people got a chest x-ray once a year for three years. And after those three years, then, the people were followed just to see what their outcomes were. In terms of who was allowed to enroll in the study, they're mostly older people in the age of 55 to 74, current or former smokers who smoked at least 30 pack years of smoking history. A pack year means if you have one pack per day and you smoke for a year, that's one pack year. And former smokers have to have quit within the last 15 years. No prior history of lung cancer and no treatment or other cancers within the last five years. And if you look at this slide here, this shows you year by year in both the CT group and the chest x-ray group how frequently their screening test was considered positive. And on average, about one quarter, 25% approximately, of the CT scans were considered as a positive scan, meaning that there is a nodule 
bigger than or equal to four millimeters, and nodules of focal abnormality in the lung, a spot, basically. On the chest X-ray, there was a lower frequency of a positive uh, test, in this case, 7%. Now, out of those scans that were considered positive, only about 3% in the CT group were actually due to lung cancer. 96% were benign causes. And in the chest X-ray group, only about 5% were considered really to be lung cancer, and only about 95% 95, 95 were actually benign. So you can see that even though one quarter of the scans were um, positive, most of those were not due to lung cancer. And the ultimate results that this trial showed is that in this, if you do CT screening compared to chest X-ray screening, that you reduce the lung cancer-specific mortality, that is the death rate, from lung cancer by 20%. And that is 87 people, fewer people died from lung cancer. Because of the high false positive rate, that is because of all the positive screens that most of them are not due to lung cancer, you need to screen about 320 people in order to save one person from death from lung cancer. This trial also showed that the overall death rate from all causes was also reduced by 7% in those who were screened with a CAT scan versus a chest X-ray, but that was mostly due to the benefit of saving lives due to lung cancer, not from other causes. This slide is just to show you that the complications related to imaging, the screening imaging, were very low. It was about 1% to 2% for both groups getting CT or CAT scans uh, or chest X-rays. And then in those patients who received treatment of some sort, also the risks of complications were quite low. And in those patients who actually had an invasive procedure, you know, if they had a lesion and that had to be biopsied, for example, looking at how many of those people died within two months after their treatment, it was a very small number, although there are some people who did die and some of these people didn't even have cancer. So there are always risks to some of these screening tests even though they're low. Some people ask about radiation dose, you know, about CAT scans. And in this study, we used a low-dose CT technique. And so millisieverts is just a, a name for the units of how much radiation you get. And on average, it came out to 1.4. So what does that mean? Well, to put it in perspective, every year, just from living your life and being surrounded by radiation, sources, we get about three millisieverts every year. The low dose CT, uh, chest CT, is about half that dose. If you flew to California and came back, you get 0 0.03 millisieverts of radiation. If you get a chest x-ray, that's about 0.1. If you get a standard diagnostic chest CT, it's about seven, about four times the low dose CT technique. Just to give you a sense of how much radiation there is from these different exposure sources. But overall, with the low-dose chest CT, it's been estimated that this can increase your risk from dying of a future cancer in up to one in 100,000 uh, chance, added to your current risk of one in five for everyone. So you can see it's very small risk. And my advice is that don't get imaging unless you actually need it. It's always a risk-benefit analysis. Just to let you know, during the conduct of the study, they also collected biospecimens in a subset of patients. And these are laboratory specimens that are now being analyzed to try and figure out who's truly at high risk for lung cancer. So smoking is one risk factor, but there are also genetic factors and other factors that can really put you at elevated risk. But these are not fully worked out yet. Also, how can you do a better job of telling which nodules that you detect on screening are really the bad ones and which ones are benign. And also, if you do have lung cancer on the screen test, how can you tell which ones are really aggressive versus the ones that are not going to do anything? And just to show you that from 10,000 participants in the study, they've collected 100,000 specimens uh, from the blood, from the urine, and from the sputum, and these are being analyzed by researchers as we speak. Now, to get to the current low-dose CT screening guidelines for lung cancer, there are different societies that have come up with different guidelines, and these are the most current ones that exist today, although they're still a work in progress. So the American College of Chest Physicians, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the American Thoracic Society 
in this paper from this year came up with these guidelines. So the people who are eligible to be screened are really the same population as in the National Lung Screening Trial, 55 to 74 years of age, current or former smokers for at least 30 pack years. They do not recommend CT screening in other age groups or people who have lesser amounts of smoking history or in people who have a lot of other medical problems that would preclude a good benefit from screening. <clears throat> they also suggest that counseling should be included and include the description of the harms and benefits of undergoing a screening test, should be performed in a center that has experience doing a multidisciplinary coordinated care, such as where the NLST was conducted. They ask to keep track of how screening is going in different patients at different centers, keep quality control in place. Tobacco cessation is strongly emphasized, which is really critical and is not replaced by screening. And currently, no one really knows how long do you have to do screening for. So in the study, it was done for three years in a row, but how do you know you shouldn't screen for 10 years or for the rest of your life? It's unknown. And how frequently is one screen per year sufficient? Is one for every two years sufficient? It's twice a year, no one knows. Now another group, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, has similar guidelines but slightly different. So they say that a group similar to the NLST should be included. However, they expanded their guidelines a little bit, saying that a little bit of a younger population who smoke a little bit less and have other risk factors for lung cancer should also be screened, such as if you have fibrosis or scarring in your lungs or you have emphysema, you have other occupational or inhalational exposure, such as from radon, or if you already have a cancer history or a family history of lung cancer, and they don't consider secondhand smoke exposure as a sufficient enough risk factor for screening, but this is a subject of debate. The American Association of Thoracic Surgery has their own guidelines, and they have one group that's similar to the NLST, but they also say that um, people who've already had lung cancer and survived because they're still at elevated risk for a future lung cancer should still also be screened. And similar to those last sets of guidelines, also think that younger people who have lesser amounts of smoking and some other risk factors should also be screened. The American Lung Association and the American Cancer Society basically have strict guidelines in terms of eligibility very similar to that of the National Lung Screening Trial and they do not recommend CT screening for other groups. It's also been shown in other studies that chest x-ray screening is not useful, so that's not used at all. And again, smoking cessation is really critical. The US Preventative Services Task Force, which is a group in the government that makes a lot of these policy decisions before insurance covers uh, screening, has not yet endorsed CT screening for lung cancer. They're waiting for more evidence. And so there are a lot of questions. Uh, which screening recommendations should be implemented? A lot of groups have different recommendations. Um, how do we integrate screening with all the other things? Prevention, diagnosing it, treating lung cancer in a standardized method. How do you extrapolate to younger people? How do you extrapolate to people who don't smoke? How do you extrapolate to places that have less experience in doing CT screening? Also, it hasn't yet been shown if CT screening is cost effective. If your screening test is not cost effective, then it wouldn't be um, possible to implement this on a wide scale. Also, who's gonna pay for it? Should the tobacco industry pay? Should people pay? Should insurance pay? That's also gonna be debated. And also, there's a high false positive rate. That is, there are a lot of positive scans that are not due to lung cancer. So what can be done to reduce that rate? And I think that's where these laboratory analyses of these specimens that were collected from the trial will be very useful. And so-called modeling analysis, that is advanced statistics, are going to be used to figure out if these guidelines can be extrapolated to other groups of patients. So in conclusion, the National Lung Screening Trial, which is a large, high-quality, randomized controlled trial, showed that CT screening reduces death from lung cancer, and the absolute risk of death is reduced by 0.33% compared to chest x-ray. That is three in a thousand people who are screened won't die of lung cancer. And those who have lung cancer who happen to be screened will not die of it 20%. One in five will be saved. 25% of the screening tests will be positive, but about 96% of those will be false positive. That is not due to lung cancer. 
and the overall risk of adverse events is low related to CT screening. Overall, the harms of the radiation from the CT scans are thought to be less than the potential benefits. Screening with chest x-rays is not recommended. Many groups, as I've shown you, do endorse CT scanning as a screening tool, but they have slight variability to who they think should be included in that screening population. And as, you know, over time, these recommendations are going to be refined and changed and debated. Right now, there is no payment mechanism. No insurance company will cover CT screening, and that's a hindrance to implementing this on a wide scale. And really, smoking prevention and cessation are still critical to reduce lung cancer from even occurring and also from preventing deaths related to lung cancer. And that's all I have for you. Thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Um, so are you saying that smokers who have quit more than 15 years ago are no longer within the guidelines? According to some of those societies, yes. Some of the ones have more flexible criteria. And that's to be debated in terms of, you know, it's always a trade-off. You could screen everyone but then you're gonna have even more false positive rates, the costs are gonna be higher, and there's always a chance of picking up abnormalities that would never have caused the person a problem in the first place, and you could potentially do harm. If you make the criteria very narrow, where you only screen those who are extremely high risk, you may be excluding people who could potentially benefit. And trying to find that sweet spot where you have the most benefit and the least amount of potential harms and the lowest costs is the part that's not always that simple. And that's why these guidelines are the way they are at present. You said the cost is not covered. What is the cost if one wanted to pay for it themselves? Gotcha. So the average Medicare cost for a chest CT is probably around $300. Um, some places tried to do something where, oh, let's do CAT scans, we'll offer it $99 or something. But the problem is that you have to pay the people who are going to read them. You've got to pay for the equipment to use to get the scans. You've got to pay for the equipment to do the analysis, all these things. And so to come up with a reasonable price that would be cost effective is, is a little tricky. One way is to decrease these false positive rates so you can really restrict the scanning to those who really are at high risk that is not just being a smoker but having some genetic factor or some other risk factor that really puts them at high risk. I think there would be a, a lower false positive rate and therefore you make the scans more cost effective. Let me, add, let me add one comment to that which is that at least in the Philadelphia region um, there are different centers, different medical centers that are coming up with screening programs and they're all designed slightly differently. Currently at Penn, we do not offer lung cancer screening yet because it's not yet been endorsed by all, sort of all the appropriate um, governing bodies. It's not yet covered by any insurance companies. There are other institutions. For example, Thomas Jefferson has a program that if you meet criteria, that is over the age of 55, it's more than 30 pack year history of tobacco, you can pay $350 and you would meet with a pulmonologist, have a low dose CT scan, and get something called pulmonary function tests. Now that program has not been very popular, I happen to know, because it costs $350 and most individuals don't want to have to spend that money out of pocket to obtain a low dose CT screening at this point. There are other centers across the country that are offering it as low as $99, so that you can literally come in with your, with your check or with your cash and get a low dose CT for $99, but nothing like that exists as far as I know in our area currently. This is in a rapidly evolving area and clearly there will be uh, radiology centers and medical centers that will pick this up um, to some varying degree um, that may require, that require patients to pay out of pocket in the short term. But ultimately, once insurance picks this up, it would be available through your insurance with probably a copay. So those things are still being sorted out. I think another factor is that you want to get your screening somewhere where if there's an abnormality detected on your scan, that there are professionals who can handle it, you see? So, yeah. And you would be the cutoff of 15 years that you had to equip in the last 15 years. Is that to say that if you equip more than that time ago, then your chances are much reduced? You're right. So for the, when they designed the study, they wanted to show that there was an effect. And so they're trying to really restrict to a higher risk population, assuming that if you quit smoking, let's say beyond 15 years, that your risk is almost the same as a person who didn't smoke. 
you see? Yeah, that's great. And so that was their rationale. It's a little bit arbitrary, but that was their thinking. I don't know, you, you may remember the graph I showed in my talk at the very beginning about when you quit. Like if you quit in your 50s, your 40s, your 30s, and risk declined. Yeah, sorry, so, this, sorry, so I can bring that up for you again. Um, but the concept is that if you quit more than 15 years ago, your risk is lower than that of uh, a current smoker, but never goes back down to the risk of a, non, a lifelong non-smoker. But, and it remains elevated. Nevertheless, the trials did not include people who had quit more than 15 years ago, so we can't comment on what amount of benefit it would give you if you fall into that group. I think that's, if you fall into a group that is at higher risk, that means you've smoked, but you don't meet criteria. That means you're younger than, you're 50 instead of 55, or you smoked 20 pack years instead of 30, or you quit 20 years ago, but you still smoked a lot in the past. It's a conversation for you and your doctor to have about what the benefit and risks are for you individually, about whether it makes sense for you individually. And it's never too late to quit. Other questions? Here, I'm sorry, I'm gonna bring this to you so everyone can hear you, sorry. Why does, why does the insurance company, um, the first thing they ask you is do you smoke? I smoke, and they can find out if you do or you don't smoke. The rate is much lower by me being by me smoking, but I'm trying to quit. So my question is, why is the insurance company, your life insurance or policy or whatever, um, asked you, do you smoke? Is that yeah. So I, you know, I'll tell you just as a layperson, I'm not an expert in this area, but you know, life insurance um, is really based on r risks of you dying within the time frame of your life insurance policy. We know that the single biggest factor in what determines uh, risk of dying in the United States is, outside of accidental deaths, at least in terms of medical death, is, is active smoking. So smoking leads to both heart disease and to cancer risk. And so most insurance companies look for that issue because uh, that, af that affects how likely you are to die in the next 20 or 30 years. And so if you are an active smoker, and they obviously, as you know, most insurance companies will take a blood sample or a urine sample to look for particular molecules that suggest that you are um, smoking, your insurance rates for a life insurance policy will be higher than that of a non-smoker. We're coming up near the end here. I'm going to introduce, us again, a new topic here. Uh, and we're going to talk about a, a resource available at uh, the University of Pennsylvania called Oncolink. And they have a, a web-based uh, system that provides cancer information, web, uh, cancer information for patients, and including information on risk. They have a new program called What's My Risk? That's going to be reviewed by Carolyn Vachani. And yes, we share the same name. She's my wife. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about general cancer risk, so not just focusing on lung cancer. Um, and for those of you who don't know what Oncolink is, we are a cancer information website. We were the first cancer information website on the internet. It started in 1994. I was actually a radiation oncologist at Penn who just thought the internet was really cool. He was a self-proclaimed geek um, and just started putting things on the web and it's grown um, significantly ever since. Um, our goal is really to provide um, accurate, up-to-date cancer information for everybody from people with a cancer diagnosis, their friends, their family, um, people in the public and healthcare providers. Because we are based at Penn, we get most of our content um, written by um, practitioners at Penn who volunteer their time to do stuff for us. Um, and the content is continually updated. It's free. Um, you don't have to register or log on or anything like that. Um, and the information is at all levels, and we don't um, divide it up. So you, as the reader, can delve as deep as you like. You could read an article that was written for a physician or a nurse, if that's what interests you. So we'll talk for a minute about cancer risk. You've obviously heard a lot today about lung cancer risk. Um, but Cancer risk is the likelihood that an individual will develop cancer. Um, it's not an exact science. Uh, lung cancer is one of those cancers that has quite a bit of research where sometimes they can give you more um, exact numbers, like you have a 15% chance of developing a cancer. But for most cancers, that's not possible. There's not enough research into it, and people don't really know those exact numbers. Um, 
and your fact the risk factors that uh, increase your risk are sometimes things that you can modify and sometimes things that you can't change your family's history you know you can't choose your family um, and some of these factors can affect your risk for multiple types of cancer. So for instance, um, consuming large amounts of alcohol can affect your risk of liver cancer, esophageal cancer, head and neck cancer. So there, sometimes one risk factor is related to a lot of things. Um, and this, just to point out that a bunch of, you know, organizations have investigated modifiable risk factors, which are those things that you can change. So things like your diet, um, exercise, um, lifestyle choices, uh, environmental exposures, m probably account for as many as 90% of all the cancers diagnosed in the United States. So there are a lot of things we, um, as people, can do to decrease our risk. Um, important to point out too that diet and nutrition probably accounts for 60% of cancer in women and 40% of cancer in men. So that's a big area where people can make changes. So um, as a website, we often get people emailing in questions to us, um, asking for information. And people are often asking about risk. A lot of times those are people who maybe someone in the family was diagnosed with cancer and then they step back and say, wait, what, why them and why not me? What's, what's different about me? Or what am I doing that's increasing my risk and that I can change? So we decided to make this little program online that could help you um, learn about your risk factors and then learn about things you can do to um, decrease your risk. So the program is called What's My Risk? Um, it's intended for people who have not had a cancer in the past. It does address lung cancer risk, but all types of cancer as well. Um, and it really, what we really wanted to focus on was helping people learn about risk factors and specifically those that they could make changes to. So it starts with a questionnaire. I just like to point out that it is a very um, detailed questionnaire and it asks a lot of questions, some a little bit personal. Um, but you should know that it's all anonymous. Um, we, we do collect what answers people give to try to help us guide further development of the program. So what areas seem to need more information or are more common to people. And um, from the answers in your questionnaire, uh, the program creates you a report detailing the risk factors, what cancers these are associated with, and then information about um, these items, modifiable risk factors, non-modifiable risk factors, prevention and screening, and then some bit about family history and genetics. That's something that we um, see a lot of misconceptions about. People assume because someone in their family had cancer that they're at this um, greatly increased risk. Um, for instance, my um, great-grandmother had breast cancer when she was 90, and people, especially breast cancer because we hear so much about it, they hear that and they say, oh my God, I'm at a high risk for breast cancer, I've got to go out and get my mammogram immediately. Um, and really that's not the case. It's a common disease in older women and probably her cancer was um, what we would call sporadic and not related to um, our family's genetic makeup. So that's something to consider and we've addressed that with different types of cancer that run in families. So this is just to show you what the screens look like. Um, this is the beginning page that you would start at. Um, over, where's my little pointer? Over here is where you would start the questionnaire. But this page is a nice introduction to cancer risk. It sort of summarizes um, some of the things we've said today and talks a little bit about why we chose to approach the program the way we did. People still ask, um, you didn't tell me if I have a 12% risk of developing X, Y, or Z cancer. And this introduction page gives you some explanation as to why we didn't do that. So this is what the questionnaire looks like. It's pretty easy to bump in the answers and um, answer the questions. 
this is the beginning of the of a result page. So there is this um, graph below where it tells you a type of cancer and then the factor, the risk factors that you have that are related to that cancer. Um, this is something that we're sort of playing around with in version two, how to make this a little more user friendly and useful. So we'd love your feedback. Um, and then you have the information. So it's broken down by modifiable, not modifiable, some information about prevention and screening, which is important for um, several types of cancer, and then the information about family history. And for some of the um, content, like for instance, this information about current smokers, it's a pretty lengthy um, bit of information, so you get this teaser paragraph, and then you click on read more to get the full information. So you can sort of delve into the areas that maybe are more interesting or more important to you, um, but you kind of have everything there in front of you. So with that said, I just encourage you to go to the website, try the program, send us your feedback, because we are working on um, improving the program all the time, and we love to hear feedback. You could. Um, it would be a very, if you printed it out, it's pretty long because it's a lot of information. But the graph um, sort of gives you the highlights. Um, and you could say, you know, show that to them and say, these are things that were brought to my attention. What kind of screening could I do? And if there is um, screening that is appropriate for someone, we do try to discuss it in the care plan. So someone maybe with a history of hepatitis and a family history, maybe they can have some kind of screening for uh, liver cancer. So we try to address those things as well. So sort of to educate you with information that you can take back to your provider. Thank you. All right, well, we are at the end. I want to thank every all of you for your attention today. We've gone through a lot of topics in the last couple of hours. We certainly have a few minutes here, and we'll keep it relatively informal. If there's questions, Frank and I are still here. Carolyn's still here. So if there's any questions, feel free to raise your hand. There we go. We got one there. Oh, I'm going to, how about if I do this? I'm going to pass this off to you. Frank and I will. Uh, in the very beginning, you talked about dietary changes or diet that put you at risk for lung cancer in specific. You know, could you talk about that? Yes. So the, the link between dietary factors and, and lung cancer is a weak one. And not to say that dietary factors aren't important um, in lung cancer risk specifically, but those, uh, those studies have just not been well done yet and, and not in enough great detail so we, that we can make specific dietary recommendations beyond eat a healthy diet. So we know from other cancer risks, and maybe Carolyn wants to comment on which ones are, are most dietary related. Um, I don't know if you want to comment. Uh, but for lung cancer specifically, we don't make specific dietary recommendations beyond eating just a, a normal healthy diet. Uh, again, the primary issue is, is risk factors such as, as smoking, asbestos exposure, radon, the ones I went through. But I'll, I'll hand it off and see if you have any specific comments on sort of um, depends on what's in a person's diet. So a high fat diet um, contributes to colon cancer. Um, maybe a, a diet um, high in salty foods or processed foods can contribute to um, esophageal or stomach cancers. So it really depends on what are the things in someone's diet that are um, sort of the problem areas. And so something that certainly if you went to the Oncolink risk program, there'd be a lot more information yeah. regarding specific dietary issues and there are links to different cancers. Thank you. Other questions? Um, is there any research um, relating um, cigar smoking to lung cancer or emphysema or anything else? There is. Um, so certainly cigar smoking is a risk factor for lung cancer. Um, what makes it a little bit harder to study is that cigar smoking is, is a little less common than cigarette smoking and a little bit harder to quantify. Most people who smoke cigarettes are pretty consistent in that they smoke a pack a day or a pack and a half. Cigar smokers tend to be a little bit more sporadic in their use, uh, but we do know from studies that cigar smoking is, causes, leads to an increased risk of lung cancer and other aerodigestive cancers, so head and neck cancers, esophageal cancers, 
Um, I don't know if Frank has more specific information. Yeah, that's, that's it. It's stomach, bladder cancer, cigar smoking is, uh, is not good for you. Uh, cancer risk with respect to smoke, whether it's marijuana smoke, cigarette smoke, cigar smoke, or, or even chew tobacco use, is really a function of degree of exposure. And so if you're talking about a cigar at somebody's wedding, uh, you know, that's not a big deal. But if you're a regular cigar smoker, you're exposing yourself regularly to significant amounts of smoke, your risk goes up. And Frank, I'll point out what my father always says is, well, I don't inhale them. Yeah, right. And I say, are you sitting in the room and breathing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a common phrase we hear from cigar smokers, that they don't do it very often. I only smoke one or two a day, and they think that that is less than smoking 10 or 20 cigarettes a day. But clearly, even, even using them occasionally, outside of the issue of smoking them at a, you know, a wedding or on, a, on real special occasions, any sort of regular use we try and discourage, because we certainly do know that any exposure to smoke causes an increased risk. And Questions? actually, just to point out that the amount of tobacco in a cigar can be equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. Right. So. How about, you, um, Frank was mentioning um, chewing tobacco as well? Right. Wow. A little, a little different in that you don't inhale it, so it's not so much lung cancer risk, but it's okay. um, head and neck and throat and mouth and yeah. those sort of areas where the, um, I don't know, what do you call the? The carcinogens the sort of spit directly yeah, spit, are exposed spit, to yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Other questions, folks? Okay. So we've given you some information on where to seek resources if questions come up for you later in, in your packets, and we really thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly tell your friends and family about this if they're interested in hearing more about cancer risk in general and have them come out to these programs next year. Thanks for coming. Thank and you. I think it